Uh, I would like to start with a couple of words uh, about PERT, although I know that most of you have heard already uh, a lot of things. PERT is, is an innovative project for Greece and a project with vision. This is what makes it different from other projects run at different times in our country. We have been really lucky to be involved with this and it is a fact that we were all working as a team. This is something that I would like to emphasize. Academics from both universities, um, teacher practitioners, school advisors, everybody pitched in this uh, product. It's what I like to think of as a dream team or even better as a magical team. <laughs> it is not often to find colleagues to work miracles with in a short time and still enjoy it that much. And in that sense, it's been both a blessing and a pleasure. And I would like to <clears throat> acknowledge now that much of this we owe to Professor Dendrinos. Um, our major contribution, as in from the part of Aristotle University, I mean, is the development of alternative materials for the third graders, as you may have already guessed. We were happy, of course, to have on board um, teachers from our experimental school in Evosmo. Some of them are here with us today, and we thank them very much. But also, as I said, this was a team project and involves other people like artists and musicians and people who really helped us into doing this. And so, first of all, it is a team project. Second, I would like to say, as you already know probably, that in the pilot stage we had it as in a black and white version. And the final products are MB2, which is ready already, and this is for the more advanced learners who have already been instructed in English in the first and second grade, and MB1, which is on its way. Um, the MB pilot MB1 is developed for beginners, whereas the MB2 for more advanced learners. Now, the materials we've created are in a sense groundbreaking because they change not only the way English has been taught in state schools so far, but also the way English is taught in Frontisteria, in private schools. They do not follow a similar approach as the commercially available books that we have, but they introduce a new era, or if we would like to say, a new mentality for the teaching of English at early levels. So it includes all these things that you can see here, like a new approach to alphabet teaching, um, lexical chunks, no pre-teaching, everything is in context. Um, we aim for implicit and not explicit grammar and rule base, so Marianne Kessenen for saying that yesterday. And um, alternative assessment, um, we also took into consideration frequency, thematic areas, systematic recycling, because recycling is something that we see but not in a systematic fashion. Um, we also promoted cognitive skills. Uh, Angelica was mentioning something about some activities that we know facilitate and enhance language learning. We have taken those into consideration. We tried to create cross-curricular links and um, also we included arts, crafts and a lot of drama play. Now, one thing that we know this book is not about is a um, dictation-based approach. Okay, and we'll talk about this a bit later, but it's not a dictation-based approach and it rejects the idea that the learner's output is definitely a replica of the teacher's output. Okay, so we think this can be very different. Um, the rationale of the book, the, very, the most important fact that we need to know here is that this is a pedagogic book or it's a pedagogically oriented book. And the child is the center. It's a meaning-focused rather than um, a, a form-focused approach, process-based, the emphasis is on the process of learning and not so much on the product of learning. And this is because it is true that the, what really counts is not always countable. Okay? And um, we are more, more worried about the meaning of words and chunks and not so much about the language structure as such. We adapt a story-based framework and I will explain in a second why. And it is a, a book that it is, as I said, not a copy from commercially available books, but it is a research-based one. And by that I mean that every, every, let's say, decision we've made or every choice that we've made was based on research. It was not just a random choice or um, something that we didn't think about it. There's some kind of thinking behind it. Okay. 
Um, we promote discovery learning through our book and multi-sensory approaches and we've, we have uh, features of multiple intelligence theory um, introduced by Gardner uh, because we do believe that individual learning differences are important and we must consider those, especially at an early stage. <clears throat> and also we should um, make sure that the pace of learning is smooth for every learner. The methodology, we know that there's no perfect method, you know, you know about this, so I don't need to explain. So therefore we followed an eclectic approach and we have different kinds of elements for different approaches. So we have features of the lexical approach, total physical response, task-based, cross-curricular, and we focus on skills. We try to integrate them, but because this is a very early stage, um, we emphasize more on receptive skills and then we expect production. Okay? This is a more natural way of doing it, especially at this stage. Of course there is uh, writing and reading, but this comes a little bit later. Okay? Gradually and much more smoothly. Okay, stories. Each story in the book has a different plot, has a moral, includes an element of surprise, and this is why we want to uh, promote discovery learning. <coughs> Most of the stories are based on well-known fairy tales or characters that we know like Pinocchio, or are inspired by Aesop myths, like the, the ant and the um, uh, cricket, um, other European uh, fairy tales as well, the emperor's new clothes, and this is because we want the children to be familiar with the, plot, so, with the plot, so that they don't feel intimidated by something completely new presented to them. But we do have four main characters that are stable throughout the book and introduce the story in its unit, and one of them, and um, I thank Rula for mentioning that, is a minority character actually, and uh, we think this is a good idea because we do have different kinds of ethnicities as well as nationalities in our classrooms. Now, although I think this is quite self-evident when we talk about young learners, I will shortly explain why we use the, the story-based story uh, teaching approach. First of all, because stories are natural, um, they're appropriate for this age, they're powerful techniques for that uh, level, and children are familiar with them from the L1. You know, everybody, when starting learning a language, even L1, we listen to stories from grandmothers, grandfathers, mothers, even uh, before going to bed. And although we know the story, we keep asking to listen to the story again and again and again until we know it by heart. We may not know every single word. We know the plot, though, and little by little, we try and produce language. Also, stories can be beautifully um, complemented with arts, projects, crafts, songs, chants, and they allow us to focus more on the meaning and less on the structure. For example, instead of teaching present continuous as such, as we normally used to do, we can uh, include the fairy tale and so the story we're going on a bare hand, and therefore we have children using it without realizing it. Okay, because of the repetitive chunk, we're going on a bare hand, we're going on a bare hand. We also adopted lexical approach, and, and again, that was a conscious decision. This is because the acquisition of lexical chunks allows children to become more fluent in, uh, in their language, and they do not have to worry so much about the structures. And I have some examples taken from both books here, like, let's see, you're back home, you're right, don't worry, what's happening? Obviously, uh, they don't know that what's happening is what is happening, okay? But um, please, don't chop down every single phrase, two words. It's not necessary, okay? They can learn it like that. All chunks are contextualized. They should not be explicitly taught. <coughs> please don't do this. And please don't kill it by drilling either, okay? Try to practice them through activities. <coughs> Grammatical structures are not explicitly taught. I have a point later on about this, mainly because this is unnecessary and meaningless at this age. Okay. Now, these are some samples of the lexical approach in both books. First, I'm talking about both books, and then I will show you differences in Magic Book 2. So here, from the, uh, on the one column, this is a lexical approach uh, activity, and then Ne right next to it, the other, when they have to um, match the pictures with the phrases. 
Here again we have a maze, we have the picture that actually shows the, uh, the lexical chunk and they have to find their way out of it. And yes, we did adopt the lexical approach, but what lexis? What lexical chunks? Is it a random choice again? We took into consideration uh, why and why, where our children are learning English and for what purpose. We also thought about appropriacy, um, age-wise and cognitively-wise, and how these lexis are related to their interests and their daily life. Another factor that is not very commonly thought of, but we took it into consideration, was frequency. Because we had previous studies, and previous studies showed that a large amount of frequent vocabulary is introduced from a very early age. However, very few common words are found between course books of the same level, and that was intriguing for us. And it shows that textbook writers seem to be highly idiosyncratic in the choice of frequent or infrequent words they use. And we were thinking, so are we going to aim only for frequency? Is that the right way? Probably not. Um, and I will ask you, do you think balloon, alien, kite or zebra, these are very high, highly infrequent words, do you think that they are useful in a Greek uh, young learner's context? What do you think? Should they be included in at this age, of course, of course, of course, because yes, a book should be research-based in, in, in a lot of ways, but again, we must think of the context in which we're presenting this book. And yes, this may be highly infrequent words and they may not, you know, use them every day, but they do use them in communicating in their own little world. We also, uh, when we finished both books, we compared um, the vocabulary that we used with the BNC, British National Corpus, and the nation's word lists, and also the English vocabulary profile. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but it is a list of phrases and words commonly found uh, according, to, uh, according to the Common European Framework. Of course, the, the only corpus that we were interested in at that level was A1 and A2. Now, when we compared all this, first of all, we had an overview of the whole in, uh, words introduced in the books. And so, as you can see, in the pilot version, we have 617 types, whereas in Magic Book 2, we have 719 words. This exceeds the 500 words per year that Cameron was talking about. But also, in Magic Book 2, we have more words because we're talking about more advanced learners and we have more units, as you will see. Now, the facts when comparing this with British National uh, Corpus and uh, the EVP. Half of the words introduced in the pilot book appear also in Magic Book 2. This means that we have a systematic choice here. MB2 is more enriched because it targets more advanced learners. Almost 90% of the words appear again in book at grade 4. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. Yes, of course, they're familiar with it, but there's a lot of recycling introduced. However, because we've already compared what uh, words are introduced in the fourth grade, the amount is almost triple, so it's not like this is again what they are doing. Okay? There's a lot of uh, extra input, added input. There's also a good amount of frequent words used in both magic books, and especially this is true more than 60%, and especially this is true from the band of the first uh, thousand words, according to the British National Corpus. And Again, more than 60% of our words belong to the EVP profile. Okay, so again, this shows the thinking behind the words and the phrases we've chosen. Actually, these are the results from the words chosen for the book. Uh, the, the results about the lexical chunks uh, that were introduced will be in a different presentation. Okay, uh, as I said, we've introduced cross-curricular features. So we have Daedalus and Icarus. Uh, these are taken from the Greek textbook at the same level. Um, nutritional habits. We also include global issues and we try to sensitize our students to it. So we have uh, things on environment, poverty, charity, human rights, and cultural elements like uh, the special day section that we had in the pilot book. And I can inform you now that in both MB1 and MB2, these special days will be only online. Okay, with a lot of materials to use because we found that only one page was not enough. 
Okay, and then we want to give you room to create more things on this. This is an example of cross-curricular link uh, that we have uh, a task from, pilot, from the pilot version. Most of you have already seen it. Again, this is from MB2 now, uh, the Delos and Nicaro story, and also um, trying to guess the season while you're listening to a certain type of weather, and you guess it throughout. Okay, through artwork. This is from pilot version again, so you probably recognize it. Raising awareness of global issues like poverty. And here what they have to do is uh, they have to do a task during that uh, activity, the first activity here. And they find in different um, uh, rooms the odd one out, they put it in the bag, in the bag they are down, and then they have a um, giveaway bazaar from things that they don't need. So this is something that they can actually organize in the school premises as well. We know today that more holistic and task-driven approaches are uh, emphasized and, and, and are encouraged. So we have experiential approaches, children first experience, then they learn and then they make discoveries. And also we have task-driven approaches where they have to complete tasks. Uh, all these promote learners' autonomy, and yesterday from the talks we see that this is a very important factor. One is autonomy, and the other is something that is intrinsically motivating for them. So what types of activities do we have in these two books? We have hand and eye coordination activities. Activities. You may think, especially when looking at the first one, this is a very childlike one, isn't it? Do you think it is? Why? Why not? Good. Fine motor skills. Yes, they're still developing. Okay, they're still developing. So we try to include this element as well. Also, I mentioned con cognitive activities that seem to enhance foreign language learning, and these are some of the types. You can see in both books the different uh, tasks. Visual perception tasks and observation, spot the differences, find the toys in the rooms, or I spy with my little eye, very popular game. Uh, can you see the duck or the hare? It took me some time to see, some time to see the hare, but I finally did it. <laughs> okay, so. um, Task-based activities. Uh, we said that task-based is important, so let's collect the magic things. Telling a story from a jumbled order, you know, uh, either with the words or without the words, doesn't matter. Um, finding out what Pinocchio has in his hand, because this is a mystery that we haven't resolved in the, book, in the unit. So we see that when we do the task and we go to different pages of the book. Or let's see what goes with a happy or a sad tooth, something that they particularly like doing. Code-breaking activities to create a bit of a mystery and uh, discovery in <coughs> learning here. Board games, seems that you are fans of uh, board games. Probably that goes back to our uh, years. And now, after I've done a, a little bit of an overview of both books and the philosophy behind them, I will talk a bit about Magic Book 2, the new book that you will have in your hands in September. This is a color version, as I said. Um, it's more extensive, it has 10 units because, um, as I said, this is for more advanced. What we haven't showed you, because we showed you a couple of things yesterday, is that apart from the actual book, the pupil's book, of course, the activity book is in two colours as well, it's not black and white, it's green and white, let's say. Okay, and the teacher's book, which I don't have with me right now, is in uh, blue and white. So two colors, and thank you very much for this. And we also have a DVD. The DVD, you'll be happy to know, will, only, will not only include sound files, it includes our songs in a karaoke form. It includes animated videos, extra activities, many types of memory games, many types of jigsaw puzzles, interactive flipbook, where you just click and you go to the next page and you know to the next game. And there is also a link to each unit and every unit, all teacher's book, all pupils and all activity. So everything will be in this CD. And even if you forget your books, let's say, you don't need to worry. All you need to have is a CD with you. 
and there will be complementary and differentiated material online. We keep enriching it. Um, so any, any kind of suggestions from you, of course, will always be welcome. What are the innovations in MB2? First of all, we changed the alphabet, okay? And I'll show you how it was and how, uh, how it has become now. We also introduced yellow background for the lesson scripts in each unit. You will see that. And we did that for, so for every, every text you see, there is yellow pale background. This is because research has shown this helps dyslexic children read. Very recently, I found out that there are other colors who also help this. So we're going to play with this in MB1 and hopefully come with the best uh, solution here. But the, um, this is uh, um, research-based evidence. We also modified alternative assessment, you, as you will see. More artwork and cut out templates because this is a time saving machine for the teacher as well and uh, also for teachers like me who when I try to design a hair uh, I have children saying that's a nice hen <laughs> so I think it's a good idea and musical background for um, every unit now let's see the differences between MB Pilot and MB2 magic letters in MB Pilot as you probably remember, we have words in thematic groups. This was for easy retrieval, for easy recall, memory-wise. And pre-reading and pre-writing skills that are being promoted. We have letter tracing activities, recognition, and then production. We had only three letters and sounds words introduced per lesson, with emphasis not on memorization, but on familiarization. And the same format of tasks so that children feel safe at the very first steps of their learning. And here you can see a sample from Magic Letters from the pilot version. And as I said, we've changed it. We've changed it and we heard your wishes. You wanted songs and you wanted rhymes and you were absolutely right. And so we have alphabets through rhymes. We consolidate from B class because we have all the vocabulary that is being introduced in A and B. And we enrich the vocabulary. We present it in context through a song, through a rhyme. We also changed the order of presentation and uh, of the letters. Now it follows a progression of the hand movement. So first, for example, you have C, then you have O, and then you have A. This is exactly how you, we work with the hand, okay? And also, we adapted elements of the Nelson handwriting. I'm not sure if you're all aware about this. This is what the British educational system promotes, Nelson handwriting system. And it has to do with where the hand is being pointed when you start a letter. Is it uh, at the beginning of the line, the end of the line, the top of the line? So we uh, included this as well. And also, as I said, the progression of handwriting. You're, we're using phonics approach, so we're not so much interested in how the letter, what, what the, let, the name of the letter, but what sound does this letter make? So we don't say e egg, we say e egg elephant. Okay, and we have two letters per session. This uh, this is to give you more flexibility. This is to show you that if you have learners that are faster, you can work with four letters at a time or with two letters, depending on your context, obviously. Now, this is a sample of the Magic Letter Land. Since this became longer, we, uh, we do not call it Magic Letters now, we call it Magic Letter Land. It's not working. Ah, it's working. This was done on its own. The mouse makes the monkey mad, the monkey man makes the monkey mad. The mouse makes the monkey mad, 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 mad. Makes the monkey mad. 
We tried to keep the thematic areas, but that was not possible in all letters. So at the beginning we have thematic areas, then it goes more independently. This is a sample story in MB Pilot. I'll show you how it changes later, but this is from the pilot version. You will see that we have a song included there. Whose is that bedroom? That's my bedroom, Beauty. It's such a mess, Beast. Don't be sad, Beast. I can help you clean it. I can help you clean the castle. The castle is my home now, too. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's clean this room. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's clean this room. I'm washing the windows. You're cleaning the floor. He's cooking and eating. He's painting the door. He's ironing. She's sweeping. We love cleaning our home. Well, many times I put this on when I'm cleaning my own house to get inspired. <laughs> well, I hope children are more inspired than me. I'm not convinced <laughs> so much. Um, now, this is a sample story from MP2. This is from an issue of me, The Ant and the Cricket. You'll see that we have songs here as well, but we also have a musical background. July and August. And it's so hot. Don't be lazy. Autumn is near. Oh, come on. Today we can play and work another day. Well? The interesting part about this story is actually that the children at the very end, they have to choose their own ending for the story. So we're taking up on uh, a game of as there. <laughs> Okay, and this is another sample story taken from uh, uh, MB2. Again, you can see the cross-curricular links with the alligators, the koalas, the pandas. They travel through, uh, they travel around the world. They go to China, Australia, and so on. And another surprise that they get is that the fi very final unit, all heroes are brought together in a different story, in a new story. All the heroes introduced in the previous unit and um, there are some uh, humanistic uh, morals there. For example, we're talking about bullying, okay, and calling names, and um, also finding the magic word, the magic word which is not money, or we hope it's not, and it's love. <laughs> okay, so we might, we try to make it more humanistic. And at the end, I think this is a very, very nice uh, task that they have to do. We do not test them on present continuous or simple present. We test their cognitive skills here. So we have a task where they have to remember things from all the previous stories. They have to spot differences. They have to remind us what they were uh, wearing, for example, or how many things they saw in a picture or where the monkey was hiding in a certain picture. So it's really interesting because we will get feedback from what they like most, for which story they like most, so they will remember more. There. Now, alternative assessment in pilot book, we introduced that self-assessment as uh, Dr. Matsuzaki said, it's not common, it's not a common thing that we have in Chris, but generally these are the first steps that we introduce here. And this is because we wanted to get, as teacher, uh, to get individual feedback about uh, also their perception of what, where they're strong and where they're weak. Um, so that they can also voice preferences in the book and we also had project as a type of alternative assessment. Here is a sample of MB Pilot alternative assessment. So you can see normally the project included a poster of you know, whatever the topic of the unit was. So they had to create a poster. Then they would give stars 
So they would evaluate how much they like the story, how much they like the story and, and then the songs and rhymes, how much they like the activities. And then they had to color these thermometers uh, up to, you know, how much they can uh, uh, speak English, can understand English, can read English and can write English. Any major trouble with this? With the last one at least? Any, any major problem that you may... Yes, everybody would color everything probably up to the top. Um, children tend to overestimate. This is a very good thing. We, we want them to overestimate you know, their abilities. But this, unfortunately, does not provide useful feedback for us. <coughs> Therefore, we, ch we kept children assessing the stories, the songs and the activities because that's interesting. But at the end of each unit, we asked them to write down, as you can see here, and we also have more in projects, and um, we asked them to write down their favorite words and phrases, whatever stuck with them, let's say, whatever they liked most. And in that way, they, we have a record keeping, uh, which is part of what a portfolio is like. As you can see also, we've changed the project, so they're much more creative and imaginative. Here, uh, we have Aboriginal art, and they have to complete the picture with another Australian animal, trying to do it in the Aboriginal way. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> And we introduced more art. <laughs> Why did, you introduce, did we introduce more art in uh, MB2? Because we saw that, uh, for example, when we had the wind and the sun story, this is just a sample, children, and we had feedback from teachers sending us this stuff, would create these kind of things. So they would write their own story, they would draw their own story, a little bit of English, not always accurate, but creating a new story with a lot of artwork done here, healthy food, unhealthy food from another topic, and we thought, you know, if, if, they, if they're so inspired by the stories, maybe we should give them more artwork to do, because this is what seems that they like, and you know, and I um, apologize for saying that, but when you ask, if we can, we deliver, when children ask, we must deliver, okay, so here, more art time, we have art time, we introduce art time. Um, in the task-based format again, but they have to do their own uh, things and cut out samples, mostly for people like me, and uh, for uh, time-saving purposes as well for the teachers. And we also introduce more cognitive activities that we found useful, like Kim's game, let's play a memory game, can you remember from previous units, inductive skills uh, activities, odd one out, grouping, and also intonation and pronunciation activities and chants because these are really important. Phonemic awareness at very early stages are very um, uh, important factors. And uh, finishing off, now I'm, I'm finishing off in a second, um, we found out in general that teachers either liked or sometimes they felt uncomfortable with this new approach of teaching, which is, of course, you know, every change has its pros and cons, of course, but it's the little things that make big things happen, we believe, and little things do count. I know that we had contradictory opinions sometimes, you know, some people uh, liked it, some people thought, oh, why couldn't we be, you know, uh, doing this the same way we've already been doing this? And it reminded me of, uh, everything that is contradictory almost. I have a goddaughter who is six years old, she's British, she had an argument with her dad and wrote to him a note. She said, Dad, I hate you. Love, Sky. Sky is her name. <laughs> so, you know, you always have different kinds of things, but what we have found is that these were frequently asked questions common by everybody. And so one was, where is spelling? Where is copying? Where is grammar teaching? Where is translation? Where are our companions? What's happening with the writing skills development? So, first and foremost, let's just clarify. Neither spelling or coping is necessary at this stage. Okay, it's not necessary as it is. They're not going to learn without them. But if you insist for any reason that you need to do them, and you have your own, uh, own reasons, and I'm sure about that, okay, then present four to six words or two to three phase, phrases each time, not the whole thing. Okay, and we suggest different types of spelling and uh, dictation, like graded, crossword, uh, crossword, Sudoku, 
And these are some examples, so I can give you an actual uh, idea of what is this. This is a shoe dog with uh, words, a picture crossword, um, putting uh, letters in order, or a graded dictation, which is the last example here. Okay, try to work and experiment more with this than with just traditional spelling and copying. I'm happy that you're getting up, it means it's interesting. <laughs> and uh, grammar. Explicit grammar is possible at this age, that's true, it's possible, and you know this because you've been working like this, but it is not necessary, and it is, in fluent speech, it's actually impossible, okay? So we teach it implicitly through phrases in the story, repetitive chunks, repetitive ch uh, patterns, songs, chants, and rhymes. Tips. First of all, we encourage teachers to create your own materials. Please do. Supplementary material, any consolidation, practice materials, not tests. Please, don't kill it. Don't do tests and companions and grammar rules. We've had some things coming to us and that's why I'm asking and I'm saying this. Greek, perhaps, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, strongly, we recommend to recycle lexical chunks. And now, uh, I will show you a video. This is not taken from our experimental school. This is because some people say that we have a different context, and you're right about that. So I'm going to show you a very short excerpt of a video from uh, the holiday, uh, from um, the end of the year um, um, theatre play that some children had, third graders, using the book. Okay. This is from Neapoli. Probably most of you know this is in the outskirts of Thessaloniki. And this is what they've done on their own with the help of their teacher, of course. Actually, there in this um, in this school. Okay. Can we all help our planet? Yes, we can. Of course, we can. And then it goes. Uh, wait. Uh, yes. Yeah. No. No. Take a shower and not a bath. Uh, no. No. No, no, it's, don't waste water, turn off the tap, recycle paper, plastic and glass, walk to school, don't litter the park. So these are quite hard words, as you can imagine, hard phrases for third graders, but through the song it was much easier for them. Um, and I, I was there, and it, it really moves me every time I look at this video, uh, because it shows that children can do much more than probably we we know or we give them credit for. It's always very moving to, to you know, to see that. Um, what I can tell you in all honesty here is that we designed, and I showed you, you know, the design, the development, we had thinking behind it, we tried to do the best, but if I had to reveal the magic uh, secret, let's say, of all this is the love for, for the children. And in your hands, the book can be magic or tragic, I can tell you that, <laughs> okay? Um, so, it may sound romantic, but yes, love was our magic secret ingredient. And since it has become clear that you, as teachers, are the magicians, please, I beg you, <laughs> leave out the tragic and let's all create magic. Thank you.